All right. Now, in John chapter 3, the section of John chapter 3 I want to I wanna focus in on is right near the beginning here, starting in verse number 3, where Jesus is speaking with Nicodemus. And um, he tells him that you have to be born again in order to see the kingdom of God. Let's reread that real quick. In verse number 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Now, this is an often misinterpreted section of Scripture here. There's a lot of people who say that being born of the Spirit means you have to be baptized in order to be born of the Spirit. And that is simply not true. Jesus Christ explains very clearly in the following verse, because he says, except man be born of water and of the Spirit, you can't enter the kingdom of God. Well, being born of the water is the physical birth. That's the flesh. That's why he says in verse 6, that which is born of flesh is flesh. You think of a woman, when she's in labor, her water breaks. And that's when a child is born, after that water is broken. You're born of the water, and then you're born of the Spirit. And it says that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. It says nothing about baptism or being dunked underwater to be born of the Spirit. We're born of the Spirit when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. We're born again. Now, I, I just wanted to bring it up real quickly, but... The whole, the, the title of my sermon today is The New Man. And this is important. That's why I'm starting with John chapter 3. Because when you get saved, when you put your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation, when you trust Him as your Savior, you have a spirit that's born inside of you. And that's what we're going to be studying today and really looking into. It's also referred to as the new man. It's... Um, it's a new birth. It's a birth that takes place inside of you where, where um, you have a new spirit inside of you. And Jesus says, you know, that we need to be born again in order to see the kingdom of God. We need to have a new spirit that's born inside of us in order for us to be saved. And the way that we do that is through believing on Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 John 5, 1, you don't have to turn there. The Bible says, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also has begotten of him. So when we believe on Jesus Christ, that's when we're born again. That's when we're born of God. That's when God becomes our father. We have earthly in a flesh. We have a mother and a father. Everybody does. You're born of a woman. You're born of a man. You have a physical mother, a physical father. When you're born again, when that spirit's born inside of you, now you have a new father. The father in heaven is your father for that spirit that's born inside of you. Now, um, <clears throat> turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 7, because uh, I want you to see this. Basically, and, and some people get confused about this, our, our, our bodies right now, we're made up, every human being in the world consists of a body, a soul, and a spirit. Some people like to think that the soul and the spirit are the same thing. They're not. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Everybody that's born has a body, a soul, and a spirit. And what happens is the reason why we need our spirit to be reborn is because the moment you sin, when you get to, there, there's an age of accountability that's, that's taught in the Bible. We're going to see this as well. But once you, um, when you start to understand, you know, right from wrong, and, and you get to this point where, you, where you, you could comprehend that, and you sin against God, that's when your spirit dies. And that's why your spirit needs to be reborn in order to be saved. The Bible says that you're in Romans chapter 7, verse number 9. Romans 7, 9. Look at what it says here. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. He says, For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. This is why we need to be born again. See, he said, I was, al I was alive without the law once. And I believe this firmly that infants, children in the womb, when, if they, when they die, they go straight to heaven. Their souls... Their, or their spirits are not dead yet. 
Because, as Paul said here, I was alive without the law once. Now, I'm just going to make a note. Um, tonight's sermon is going to go hand in hand with this morning's sermon. So if you want to come back tonight, tonight I'm going to be preaching on original sin because it's going to deal with this subject a lot more in depth. But I wanted to lay the groundwork this morning just about the new man and having this spirit born inside of us because the, the two, you, you can't separate the two, but they're definitely going to be separate sermons. So I'm going to get a lot more into this topic tonight about about children be, you know going to heaven and all of this stuff but when we're you know we're born everybody is born with a body a soul and a spirit when we sin the spirit dies which is why our spirit needs to be reborn when we put our faith in Christ that spirit is born again and we have it's it's quickened it's made alive and um, it's born of the word of God now turn if you would to first Peter chapter 1 1 Peter chapter 1. <clears throat> 1 Peter 1, right near the end of the Bible. And this is important doctrine to have nailed down. This, a lot of this goes hand in hand with our eternal security, with us being, being born again, with that spirit that can't die, that everlasting life that we have is found and, and is, um, is mingled in with our, with our new spirit. Now, um, 1 Peter chapter 1, if you're there, look at verse number 17. The Bible says, And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, Pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. For as much as ye know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So, of course, this is, this is common knowledge, I think, to probably everybody in here. Our redemption, our re, you know, redeeming us, uh, us sinners... It's, it wasn't made with corruptible things. It wasn't made with the, with the, with the filthy mammon, the, the, the money of this world. It wasn't made with silver and gold or any of these other things that are corruptible, that, that can see corruption and just perish and pass away. But it was with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. It was a, it was a, a very, very costly high price that was put on our salvation. The precious blood of Jesus Christ. He was without blemish. He was without spot. He was a perfect Lamb of God without any sin to redeem us, to pay for all of our sins. Let's keep reading verse number 20. Who verily was foreorda foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. Verse 22. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. See, when we're born again, the, the, just as with, in physical, with a man and a woman, there's the man's seed needs to conceive inside the woman's womb. Well, when we're born again, that seed that conceives is the word of God. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We need to, you know, you, you hear the word preached from a preacher, a preacher that's sent out. Romans 10 goes through the whole list. But um, you hear that word. That word takes, that is, is a seed that gets planted in your heart. And the moment you put your faith on the word, on Jesus Christ, that's when that, that seed can take root and that new life is created. And again, this goes so hand in hand with what we're preaching on tonight because the Bible refers to children when, you know, when Mary was with child. There's another verse that says she conceived seed. 
just just showing you that conceiving the seed is automatically being with child well when that seed is conceived inside of you that word of God that's when that new spirit is born inside of you and that seed is not corruptible that seed is perfect it's the word of God which liveth and abideth forever the word is everlasting it is perfect it is without spot it is without blemish that is what is born that is what our you know our father and that is part of our spirit of who we become that's born inside of us verse 24 let's keep reading here for all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as the flower of grass the grass withereth and the flower thereof falleth away but the word of the Lord endureth forever and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. So he's explaining, look, our flesh is like the grass. The grass, you know, passes away. That's gone. It dies. It withers. And it's gone. Well, that's what's going to happen with our flesh. But our spirit, the spirit endureth forever. That's why we have everlasting life. We're born of the spirit. We're born of the word. We're born of that seed that's inside of us. And, and when that seed takes root and, and, is, and becomes a life inside of us, that life endures forever. The same way that, that Jesus Christ says, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. His word endures forever. The word is what saves us. The word is, basically becomes a part of our, new, of our new man, the new inner man inside of us. And that seed that's planted is what gives us our life. Um. And this is also why we have an inheritance and we're considered fellow heirs with Jesus Christ because we're born of that seed. And it's really amazing how, how everything fits together in the Bible, but Jesus Christ is called the Word. He is the Word of God. And John 1 says, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. And then later on it says the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus Christ is that word made fresh. flesh because we're born of the word. We're literally born of Jesus Christ. We're born of the word. We become fellow heirs with him. And that's why we could be even called brethren with him. Now we're adopted brethren, but at the same time, we're going to, the Bible says we're going to receive an inheritance as, um, as fellow heirs with Jesus Christ. And, um, This new man that we're preaching about this morning, every saved person has this new man. And this is the incorruptible man that doesn't sin. And this is, this is kind of a hard concept to get to. We're going to get back to this at the end of the sermon. But um, there's, there's some verses, there's some section of scripture I think that might be kind of hard to understand at first. And it's difficult to, to make it fit in the Bible and, and, and try to figure out what it means. But... Um, it's important to understand that that incorruptible man that we have is pure. And this is why when we die, our body passes away and is buried in the ground. You know, this flesh is what causes us to sin. But that new spirit inside of us, when, you know, when any saved person, when the moment they breathe their last breath, they're going to go to be with the Lord in heaven. And there's no sin in your spirit. There's no sin there. The sin is going to be left behind in your body and in your flesh. And one day we're going to be getting a new body. Let's turn, if you would, please, to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, because we're going to see some more attributes of the new man. <clears throat> Galatians 6.15 says, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. We have a new creature that's born inside of us. And that's what we'll be looking at here. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And then the next place we're going to is Romans 6. And we're spending quite a bit of time in Romans this morning. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14 reads, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. 
to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Verse 17, this is something that's often misconstrued by people um, who try to tell you that you have to have good works in your life and all this other stuff in order to show that you're saved. Now, and what they'll do is they'll point to this verse. And this is, this is important to understand because there's a lot of people who, who believe this way. But we need to understand that we have, there's basically, there's, there's a dichotomy in our body once you're saved. You have a new spirit. The new man is born without, inside of you that wars against the flesh. And these two are contrary, the one to the other. So the, the flesh battles the spirit. The spirit battles the flesh. Putting your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ is what gives you that new spirit. Okay, but the flesh does not go away. That flesh, all these, these old things that are in the flesh, all the old sins that you like, guess what? When you get saved, your flesh still likes those things. If you were given to, to drinking, guess what? After you're saved, your flesh is still going to like that sin. If you're, whatever it is that you were given to doing, whatever it is that your flesh liked to do and took pleasure in satisfying doing, your flesh is still going to like those things. But now you have a spirit. You also have a spirit now to say, yeah, I don't like those things. I like the things of the, of the Bible. I like the things of God. That is what the, the spirit wants to do. But, it's, but it is a battle. And we have to be important. Be, er, it, we have to make sure that when we look at people, you can't, just, you can't just say, well, that person said they got saved, but they're still drinking, so they must not have gotten saved. Okay, because you still have this old flesh. It's still here and it's still a struggle and still a battle. Now, if a person decides to be walking in the flesh, it doesn't mean they don't have the new spirit that's born again inside of them. It just means that they're choosing to walk in the flesh and not in the spirit. That's why we have so many admonitions in the Bible telling us to walk in the spirit, telling us to walk in the spirit in the right ways and to mortify the deeds of our body and to do these things. If it was an automatic thing, and people have this, this false concept that as soon as you get saved, well, it's just an automatic thing. They say, well, it may not happen overnight, but it's, but it's, but it's definitely going to happen 100% for sure. And they'll point to this verse. They'll say that, therefore, in verse 17, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. So they see old things are passed away. You're not going to drink. You're not going to steal. You're not going to do any of this stuff anymore. Behold, all things have become new. But what they're failing to realize there, it says, all things are become new. That's everything. If, if this was being applied to just our sinful life prior to salvation, then this would have to mean, if you're going to interpret it that way, all things becoming new would have to mean all of your sins are just gone. Every single one of them, you are just sinlessly perfect. And my friends, that is impossible. If you, if you take it to the logical end of trying to use this scripture to apply it to just say, well, all of your old sins will be gone if you're saved and all things have become new. It doesn't say some things. It doesn't say, well, the bad things like drinking are done away, but, you know, you still have other sins. No, it says all things. But the reason why all things have become new is because of that new creature. The new creature, all things are new for that new creature that's inside of you. All things are not new for the old flesh. They are the way it has been for the flesh. But for the new creature, all things are become new. That's why now you're going to have a desire to serve God, to, to do things for God, to read your Bible, to know the truth, and, and to do these things. It's going to come from that new creature, from that spirit. And that's what's become new to us as believers. Look at, uh, let's flip over to Romans chapter 6. We're going to see some of these admonitions on how we should walk in newness of life. Those are things that we should do. It doesn't mean you automatically will that, that all of a sudden, just by virtue of being saved, that all of a sudden your life is just going to be good. And if someone's not living a righteous life, then they must not be saved. That is a false belief. We've got to be careful about that. Now, you might be able to get some kind of indications you know, I'm not saying that, that there's no way to ever try to judge. I mean, we don't know man's heart is the bottom line. And any time I'm trying to figure out whether or not I think a person is saved, it's, it's always going to be for the purpose of, well, if I don't think they're saved, I'm going to try to give them the gospel. So if you see someone and maybe they have a testimony that they believe, but, you know, you, you think, well, how, man, how, you know, they're, they're living a wicked lifestyle. It's not a bad thing to bring up the gospel to that person again. I'm not just going to say, well, there's no way that person's saved. But the way I judge people is by the words that come out of their mouth. 
I mean, if someone's going to lie to me about putting their faith in Christ and they're going to lie to me about what they believe, there's nothing you can do about that. I mean, that's, that's on them. But what I'm going to do, since the Bible says that the only thing that we must do to be saved is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, well, hey, I'm, I ask people. Now, just because they're in sin, look, I got saved when I was 20 years old. 20 years old, I put my faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, I didn't go to church for a long time. I didn't get baptized for a long time. I continued to go out to the bars, to hang out with my friends and do all this stuff. Was I saved? You better bet I was saved because I put my faith on Jesus Christ. But someone on the outside looking at me, did they see a changed life? Did they see me start doing other? No, they didn't. If people were to look at me, you'd be like, that, he's a Christian? But I had, a new, I had a new creature. I was born of the Spirit. I, I, I know that for a fact. And I did everything that the Bible said I had to do to, to inherit eternal life, to have eternal life. And that was put my faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. People can be born of God and still have the flesh and still walk in the flesh. And we need to, we need to make sure that we, that we get this. Let's look at Romans 6, verse number 3. The Bible says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now, should we walk in newness of life? Absolutely. I mean, after you get saved, you should change your life. You should get on track. You should read your Bible. You should get in church. You should get rid of all this sin in your life. You should do those things. Absolutely. But does it say that every person will walk in newness of life? Every single person that gets saved is going to do that? No, it says we should. Verse number five. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Again, should we serve sin? No. For he that is dead is freed from sin. For if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse number 12, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lesser of. Again, if it were impossible for a saved man to just walk in the flesh and do all these sins, then why is he telling us to let not sin reign in your body? He's, he's, he's commanding us, saying, look, don't let sin take over your life. Don't let sin reign and have control in your mortal body. It's our mortal flesh. This mortal body still has the capability and, and still can lead us into sin and we can choose to walk in that flesh. Don't let it reign in your life is what he's saying. Because we have the choice. Because we have that free will. We have the option to choose. Every single day you wake up, that's why Paul said, I die daily. When you, when you wake up in the morning, you can choose. Am I going to try? Am I going to walk in the spirit? Or am I going to walk in the flesh? Am I going to do what's right in God's eyes or am I just going to do whatever my, my physical heart wants me to go out and do? This fleshly heart that I have. Verse 13, he says, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Again, yielding. That's something that you are in control of. You're allowing your body to do this or you're allowing your body to do that. You yield your members as instruments of righteousness, not as unrighteousness unto sin. It's, it's, it's a very basic um, doctrine, but it's important because a lot of people get this screwed up. We need to understand that, that we still have this sinful flesh. And just because a person sins doesn't mean that they're not saved, that they don't have that new spirit inside them. Let's keep reading. Verse 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Over and over again, I mean, this, this, is, this is all saying the same thing. Look, we have the choice. Should we sin? No. But do you have a new creature? 
Yes, if you're saved, you have that new creature. It's born again, and it's born of incorruptible seed. That is not corruptible. That new creature is not gonna is not gonna sin. But we have the choice to walk in that new creature or in the old flesh. Verse 16, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. Flip over to chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. Verse number 5 reads, But when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of a letter. Again, we should serve. Let's jump down to verse number 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. And this is kind of a little bit of a tongue twister, but what Paul's trying to say here is that, look, the things that I, that I do, I don't want to do. So you see, he, he's, he's talking about himself being carnal. And ever he says, the law is spiritual, but I'm carnal. I'm living, I have this flesh, so the things that I want to do, I'm not doing them. The inner man, the new creature, wants to serve God. He wants to go soul winning. He wants to read the Bible. He wants to pray. He wants to do all of these things that are right. But because of his flesh, he's not able to do that. He says, for what I would, would means want. So it's like what I, what I would do, that do I not. What I want to do, I don't do it. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that, which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. So here he's explaining that, that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. In our flesh, there is no good thing. The, the flesh is just full of sin, and the flesh is what drives us to sin. And that's why he's trying to explain it. Now, if, if I do that, I would not. If I do the things I don't want to do, it's not me that's doing it. It's sin that dwelleth in me. This isn't to absolve responsibility for you choosing to walk in the flesh. We have to understand this because it's easy to say, oh, well, I didn't do it. You know, like you go out and like, I just go out tonight tomorrow, and I just go out to the bar and I get drunk and, and I commit adultery. Oh, it wasn't me. You know, that was just my flesh. That's not quite what he's saying here. He's saying that, look, this sin is coming from this other nature that we have. I mean, in, in a way, as a Christian, you're schizophrenic. You have a, you have a flesh... That, that, that has this desire to go out and sin, but you also have the spirit. We have the control. We have the will to be able to make that decision. And we are held responsible for it. But when he's saying it's not I that do it, he's talking about the inward man. He's talking about that new creature because that's who he's identifying with. He's like, I am no longer, because you really aren't. You no longer are that old man. You've become a new creature in Christ. That old flesh is as crucified with Christ on the cross. That's not who you are anymore. Now, it's a part of you still until the day of redemption. Well, not until the day of redemption necessarily. It depends on when that happens. But when we uh, either we're going to receive our new body when Jesus Christ comes back, or if we don't make it that long and he comes back a little bit later, then when we pass away, that flesh stays behind here. And that's no longer a part of us. So our body, soul, and spirit, hey, that body stays here. Our soul and spirit go up to be with heaven until we get a new body again. Um, but that's why he's saying that 
it's not me that's doing it. It's this sin. It's this flesh. And this is the Apostle Paul. You want to talk about a righteous Christian? You want to talk about a man of God who, who, who did so many good things and he's saying, I'm carnal? You know, I'm doing things that I don't want to do. We know, obviously, the Apostle Paul was a sinner. I mean, we, we know that anyways, but, but he's stating it as a, as a fact here. Look, there's things that I want to do. I want to serve God. I mean, I think about times, man, you know, I, I really want to go out soul winning. I want to read my Bible. I want to pray. There's so many things I want to do with the time that I have, but oftentimes I find myself not doing them. Why? Because the flesh says, oh, man, I'm really tired. I need to take a nap. Or because the flesh says, oh, you know, I, I want to go catch this sporting event. Or the flesh says, oh, I want to go do whatever. I mean, just drawing you away from serving God. And we have that dichotomy. We have, we have both aspects in ourselves. Verse number 21, let's keep reading here. He says, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. This is that new man. He's, we take delight in God's laws. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. After we're saved, we have this battle that's going on between that flesh and that spirit. Some people yield themselves to the flesh. And that's sin. And that's wrong. And that brings a bad testimony on Jesus Christ. That brings a bad testimony, a bad witness of them being a Christian, as I was after I got saved and continued to just live a wicked lifestyle. But it doesn't make those people not saved. And, and, and it's really important that we, that we have this understanding because... People today are trying to mix in, the, the devil's always trying to mix works into salvation one way or another. If he can't do it in the beginning, he'll say, well, you need to do works to be saved. Then he tries to backdoor it in and say, oh, well, if you're not doing the works, then you're not saved. Either way you cut it, when you start adding in that works and say, well, no, you have to have these works either to be saved or else you're not saved, it's, it's, it's trying to, to blur the lines of, of salvation and trying to get people to think that, oh, well, I must not be doing the works or I must not be saved because I'm not doing the works and start to believe, well, I need to be doing the works to be saved. And, and you, start, you start adding that works at the beginning or the end and you're going to come up with a false doctrine on, on salvation and it happens so many times. People say, oh, no, 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 you're saved by grace. But if you're not out there doing the works, you're not saved. That's just not true. Because we still have this old flesh. Galatians chapter 5. Turn, if you would, please, to Galatians chapter 5. <clears throat> and it's another place that people will turn to to try to say, oh, this person's not saved because they don't have the fruit of the Spirit. And um, we'll look at that real quick right now. Galatians chapter 5, verse number 16 says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other so that ye cannot do the things that ye would, the things that you want to do. But if ye be led of the Spirit, you're not under law. So he's saying, again, it's a commandment. He's, he's saying, look, you need to walk in the Spirit. And if you walk in the Spirit, you're not going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. Because it's basically with the man, you could, you could either do one or the other. I mean, you're either walking in the Spirit or you're walking in the flesh. You never really walk in both at the same time. If you're walking in the Spirit, he says, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you're walking in the Spirit, if you're, you know, when you're just focusing on the Bible. And, and here's, this is a good tip anyways. For anyone who's struggling with sin, maybe if you've just newly got saved or, or maybe you've backslidden or whatever the case may be, and, and maybe you're not in that case now, but just remember this in the future. If you ever get to that point, you ever backslide, you ever get, and, and you're just really walking in the flesh and you're just doing a lot of sinful things, 
The Bible says, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So whatever that may be, um, whatever sins you might be dealing with, if you can replace those things with just walking in the spirit, you won't do the lust of the flesh. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you're walking in the spirit, you're going to be doing the things that God wants you to do. You're going to be, you know, spend more time reading your Bible. If you're struggling with a certain sin, and again, it doesn't matter what it is, add more Bible reading to your schedule. You have a schedule, lay out your schedule in advance. Think, okay, here's the day that I have. I have to go to work for eight hours or 10 hours or 12 hours or whatever it is on this given day. I'm going to get up at this time. I've got, you know, I got to get ready for work. I'm going to go to work. When I get off of work, what am I going to do? See, when you, when you don't know what you're going to do, that's oftentimes where you end up walking in the flesh instead of walking in the spirit. But if you already say, you know what, I really want to get right with God. I want to walk in the, in the spirit. I don't want to deal with the sin anymore. I don't want to be in bondage to the sin that's in my life. So what I'm going to do then is I'm going to read my Bible and then I'm going to pray and then I'm going to, you know, go out and knock on some doors and go soul winning. You know, whatever it is, there's, there's so many things you can do to make sure you're walking in the spirit. And if your focus, if your life is starting to revolve and, and you're spending your free time on these types of things, you're not going to have to worry about, about the lusts of the flesh. Because if you're, the more you walk in the spirit, you're not going to be walking in the flesh. And um, they're contrary one to the other. You cannot do the things you would, he says, talking about the flesh. And... See, people, I said we we're going to look at the, um, the fruit of the Spirit. So it says here, this wasn't my notes, but we'll go over it anyways. In verse number 19, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. This is why people will say, and they'll look at these works and say that person isn't saved is because of this verse. But what is this a misunderstanding of this verse? They which do those things. Like Paul said, you know, it's not me that does it. It's sin that dwelleth with me. Now, does that mean it's impossible for a saved person to do any of these things? Of course not. But these are the, 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 the works of the flesh. If you are walking in the flesh, yeah, you're, you know, you're, you're bound to do these things. But when you have that new creature inside of you, that's where, it, where this plays in, what, what Paul was talking about. It's no longer I that do them, it's sin that dwelleth with me. Your flesh, our mortal flesh, is not going to inherit the kingdom of God. That is the part of us that, that is going to stay behind here. But those who are not saved, they have a dead spirit. And they have a, the dead flesh, so they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God until they have that new creature. Because all of these things is all they know because that's, that's all they can walk in. They can't walk in the new creature. They can't walk in the spirit because they don't have the Spirit. So this is all they have and this is all they know and that's why they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God because they don't have that new creature. But then it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. See, we do live in the Spirit. We have the Spirit, the new creature inside of us. We live in the Spirit, but we also need to make sure we walk in the Spirit. They're two different things. We have the Spirit because we live in the Spirit. That's why the, the law is of no effect unto us. Because we live in the Spirit, we have Christ. We don't, we don't, we don't have that curse of the law, but we also need to walk in the Spirit. Um, let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. Finishing off that chapter there. Let's turn to one more place. We've got one more place to turn to, and then we're going to call it uh, a morning. 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, because this is another, I think, portion of Scripture that some people have a hard time comprehending and, um, and understanding. But I think after all the groundwork we've laid in understanding the new creature, understanding the new man inside of us um, will, will help us to understand this, this chapter a lot better. And it's important to note in, in 1 John, did I, I said 1 John, right? I didn't say John. I said 1 John chapter 3. Okay, good. 
Because that's where I want you to do 1 John 3. In 1 John 1, he starts off the chapter basically saying in verse 8, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his, and his word is not in us. He starts off just to make that clear. Look, we're all sinners. We know that we have sinned. We know that we've done this. But then he's going to go in to a little bit of a deeper topic here. And he's going to be talking more about the new man in, in chapter 3. So in chapter 3, look at verse number 6. He says, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. So he started off in the very beginning of chapter saying, look, if you say that you haven't sinned, you're deceiving yourself. The truth's not in you. He's saying, like, if you say you've never sinned before, if you say you don't have sin. But now he's saying, whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Let's keep reading. Verse 7. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. This can be very hard to understand, especially at first if we don't have a good grasp on that new man, because this would seemingly be a contradiction in the Bible. You say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. You, you just said that we all have sinned. You know, the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So how can you say that whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin? Say, hey, I'm born of God. Does that mean I don't ever sin? Yes and no. <laughs> yes, I don't ever sin in the sense of my new creature. That new man, that new creature that's born inside of me doesn't sin. And that's who Paul was aligning himself as being. It's, not, it's no longer I that sin, but sin that dwelleth in me. It's no longer, it's, it's not me. So whosoever is born of God, that creature that's born of God, that does not commit sin ever because it's born of God. For his seed remaineth in his name because the reason why whosoever is born of God does not commit sin is because his seed remaineth in him. God's perfect seed remains in that creature. It's a part of that new creature. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. But like I said, we have, we have, a, we have a schizophrenic brother that lives with us. That, that, that sinful flesh that does sin. And that's, and that's also a part of who we are right now. It won't be a part of who we are in a short period of time. But for right now, it is. In verse number 10, he says, In this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. We know that we have passed from death unto life, because we love the brethren." He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Now, in 1 John 3, 14, we see there, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. That's a way for us to know, you know, hey, we, you know, we have love for the brethren, we know that we've passed from death unto life, but the way that we pass from death unto life is not by loving the brethren. In John 5, 24, this was basically referring to what Jesus Christ said in John 5, 24. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. That's John 5, 24, explaining that whosoever believeth on the Lord Whosoever believeth on him is passed from death unto life. So we see here, we know that we pass from death unto life. We know that we believe when we love the brethren, when, when we do these things. That's what this verse is saying here. And then um, let's keep, finish off this chapter, verse 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good and seeth his brother have need, 
and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the spirit which he hath given us. <clears throat> Overall, I don't think it's, it's, it's not a very difficult concept to grasp, but it is an important one to understand that we have that new spirit that's inside of us. Um, and over and over again, when we're in, these, in these sections of scripture that we read, where it is, where it can be somewhat confusing, I, the, God is real careful in the Bible to make sure he includes um, real close to that area that, that, you know, it's not the good works that save you. You know, the salvation is believing on his son, Jesus Christ. So he said, this is a commandment that you believe on, his, on, on the name of his son, Jesus Christ. And these references being passed from death unto life to, to make sure that we're clear that salvation is not of works in any way, shape, or form. And this is any, no contradiction to that. But it's that new creature, it's that new man inside of us. And we need to strive to walk in that new creature. Because that new creature is, is, is who we are. And that, that is who we're going to be only in the future without this sinful flesh. We have to recognize that we still do have this sinful flesh. It's not an automatic thing that we just won't sin anymore because we're saved. We need to, to mortify the deeds of our flesh. We need to, to die to flesh daily and make sure that we're walking in this new spirit that we have. And um, don't let anyone try to, to confuse you over this topic or, or try to, to preach a false gospel and say that if you're not, if you're not doing what's right or if you, do, if you go back and sin something that you've done before, then you aren't really a new creature and you don't have that in you. No, you still have the old flesh. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the new creature that's born inside of us, dear Lord, that's born of, of the word of God. God, we thank you for that amazing gift of salvation. Lord, I pray that you please stir up our spirits, help us to go out and to, and to preach the gospel unto the lost, to bear that precious seed, dear Lord, and to, um, to allow others to have that opportunity. As, as the Bible says here, that we're, that we're ambassadors for Christ, that you've committed unto us the word of reconciliation, dear Lord. Help us to reconcile sinners unto you through the blood of Jesus Christ, dear God. And um, we thank you for, for giving us a new life, for quickening our spirit, dear Lord, and for, um, for giving us a new creature that doesn't sin. Lord, how glorious that's going to be when we're finally parted from this sinful, wicked flesh that, that we all have and that we will be with you, dear Lord, without this, without this flesh and serving you, and, and we'll always be walking in the Spirit and having that love and joy and peace, and all the great fruits of the Spirit will be a, a continual thing without the, the burden of this flesh, dear Lord. We pray that you please just have mercy on us and help us to, to continually mortify every single day we wake up, dear Lord. Help us to plan out our days so that we're not going to give any type of... Um, advantage or any type of opportunity to walk in the flesh, dear Lord, but that we would keep ourselves occupied and preoccupied with serving you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.